Welcome to Harlem Speaks, part of the National Jazz Museum in Harlem's educational series. And this is the second part of an interview with bassist and educator and composer Rodney Whitaker. And since this part of our interview with Professor Whitaker deals with his efforts in education, uh, we thought we would start with something from the 2020 Jack Rudin Jazz Championship Finals, uh, something that Jazz at Lincoln Center put on. And this is a performance from April of 2020, and it is the jazz orchestra that Professor Whitaker conducts at the Michigan State University, where he runs the program in Lansing, Michigan. And we'll hear them playing Chick Corea's Amando's Rumba, as arranged by Carlos Enriquez. And then we'll go to Professor Whitaker himself and find out how all of this happened.
Lauren Schoenberg, Senior Scholar at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. It's my pleasure to welcome back uh, great Rodney Whitaker, bassist, composer, extraordinaire, but there's another part of his career that's equally extraordinary and uh, equally far-reaching, and that's what we're going to talk about in this second part of our interview. Rodney, welcome back. Thanks for making time for us. Thank you, Lauren. It's great to be here. Yeah. I'm so glad you could find time for us. I, uh, I would like to talk in this part of our interview um, about the creation, the genesis of, and then the, the building of what is uh, incontestably one of the great uh, academic jazz programs in the United States, probably in the world with an august oh, reputation. Okay. Well, yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for doing it because it's a fact. And, uh, you know, uh, amongst professional musicians and people out in the field, so to speak, uh, you know, um, uh, there are a handful of jazz programs that always wind up being talked about with the greatest respect and, and that are, uh, quote unquote, real. And Rodney, I was wondering if you could tell us about the genesis and, uh, and the growth of this great program. Well, you know, initially how we got started at MSU, they, they always had some sort of jazz program since about 1962 or so, 50, maybe 58 around the time Indiana started. There was a, it's an interesting story that they weren't allowed, like many music schools, to play jazz in the music building, although they had like a really good big band for years and years and years, and they actually won Notre Dame in 1962. They won the Notre Dame Jazz Festival and they beat University of North Texas in Indiana. Those were the three finalists that year. And there was a graduate assistant that conducted the band by the name of Bob Kernow. So he was he had recently graduated from University of North Texas and then came up to Michigan State. And so for years and years, and then under the direction of Ron Newman, who actually hired me there in 94 as a visiting guest artist, they always had good bands, but not a degree program. And, um, and so there was, there was a guy in, in the early 80s, and I kind of had gone back and studied the history of the program. And there was a guy in the early 80s, a composer, a classical composer that always liked jazz. There was a director of music then at, at Michigan State. Uh, named H. Owen Reed, who kind of gave the approval to have improvisation and um, jazz courses, big band. And so they grew to have three big bands in a very short time. And fast forward, and the guy, Peter Dominguez, who's also at Oberlin, Ron Newman was director of the program. Peter Dominguez kind of was the second in charge. And, uh, but they didn't have a degree program. And so they hired me there and several other jazz musicians from the community. 94, 95, Lewis Smith taught there as well. And then um, in 95, I became the jazz bass teacher while I was just joining the Lincoln Center Band. So in my early days at MSU, I was back and forth to New York playing with Lincoln Center Jazz and adjunct faculty. And then in 2000, the d director, who's now the dean, Jim Forger, asked me if I wanted to be the director of jazz studies. And I really, I really had no experience in, uh, of running a program or anything of this magnitude. I never thought of, of myself as a leader in that respect, but he saw some, some potential in me to be a leader and empowered me to do such a so. And so I came and I really, um, the first year, I think I failed miserably because it was way more work than I really wanted to do and commit myself to. And um, I, had, I had to do a lot of growing uh, in order in the leadership uh, aspects to grow because I, I think I was one of those players that really did not have a lot of respect for education in that way because I was educated in a different way. I went to college for a year and uh, studying classical bass. And then about a year into school, I got a gig on the road as we talked about in our last interview. And so my education was very, very, very different. And I didn't really have a lot of respect for the way college jazz programs were. 
And um, so when I got into the job, I realized that it was a lot of work and I had a lot of community building to do and really building relationships with my colleagues at the college. And I really didn't want to do that because in my world, I play a gig and I'm gone. I'm gone to the next gig, the next situation, flying on airplanes. So I really, and so I, after the one semester of doing the job, I tried to quit because it was way more work and I wasn't communicating and I wasn't doing the thing. And so the director of music, Jim Forger, decided that I needed a mentor. And so he, he got a, a woman named Ruth Hamilton, who is one of the foremost authorities in the world on African diaspora to be my mentor. And she met with me just before Christmas, the end of my first semester in 2000 as the director. And she uh, listened to me and let me complain to her. And, uh, and so two weeks later, she met with me after Christmas and she yelled at me for two hours and told me I needed to grow up and that I had to accept that I'm in this position for a reason and that Martin Luther King died so I can have my job. And she said, now you also need to call that boy Marcellus and ask him to be your mentor because you have to get your leadership thing together. And so I immediately called Winston Marcellus and said, well, Ms. Hamilton said that you need to be my mentor. So he suggested a lot of books for me to read on leadership. And she, she would talk, to, talk me through the whole academic understanding, you know, navigating uh, relationships and who are the people I need to make good relationships with. And uh, so it was really an education. Like I had to undergo like a re-education of the way I thought about the world and life. And I think a lot of times I realized why jazz players are not necessarily successful in this world because we, we spend a lot of time traveling and moving around and uh, we don't have to make the same long relationships. But then when, once I started to get these skills together, I started to notice that the people who were the most successful in jazz had all those skills together. If I could just ask you, because I think a lot of people listening would A, like to know what some of those books were. I mean, I know it's a long time ago, if you remember some of them uh, and or what they specifically sure. talked about and B, um, uh, well, actually, yeah, let's just stick with A. What were some of those sure. books? Well, the number one books that went and had me read were the John Maxwell leadership books. And a lot, a lot of people don't like it, you know, because a lot of his uh, thing is based on like sort of like Christian philosophy. So a lot of people get hung up over that kind of thing. But the books were, I think one is called 21 Irrefutable Rules of Leadership. Um, and, and then they're the 101 books that he wrote. If you don't have a lot of time, he has four one-on-one books that are very short that have uh, a lot of really positive information. But those books were very helpful. But the irony of it is the book that's been the most inspirational to help me navigate being a, a, a good leader is Sidney Bechet's book that went and told me to read called Treat It Gentle. Yeah, tra treated gentle was. Uh, can you still hear, hear me? Uh, we got frozen there just a little bit. You're looking right now. You're okay. So I'll I'll take it back from my question about treated gentle. Sure. Um, treated gentle. Oh, all that writing about Omar, and oh yeah, and all those figures. Please tell us about that. That's fascinating. Well, the one thing in the opening chapter. Uh, of the book, the first chapter of the book, he talks about being in being in being in France and playing a gig in Paris. And there's a, a white American gentleman who comes up to him and goes into this whole thing about what jazz is. And it's his interpretation of what jazz. And he said, I'm not, I'm not jazz, I'm only a part of jazz. And that if you could feel a melody or you could feel the music, then it's your music. 
because the reality of it is I realized that I'm, I come from a culture. I grew up in jazz culture in Detroit. And that's a very specific culture based on bebop, based on learning a certain kind of way. And I really had to develop patience for a lot of my students in the beginning that didn't have the sort of cultural background that I had. And I, and I, I realized in reading everything in this book, he had become, he was an angry young man who had become very humane. And he had, to, he was a wild guy who over time through relationships and, and people and loving people and being a humanistic person that he matured and kind of settled. And so I had to, I had like a lot of things because I had a, a very specific way of looking at life. And because people were, we were always excluded from things. I realized, I realized from reading this book of my own plight. So I always kind of see myself in it. And what I realized is that we didn't have respect for this because there was no possibilities for us to be in this world, in the academic world. And um, it didn't matter how much education we got or how many degrees we had, we weren't going to be a part of that world. But I was actually educated as a kid by so many PhD teachers. I had so many people that could have been college professors or should have been college professors. They were my middle school teachers. I learned Greek mythology in middle school. I learned uh, Latin in middle school, taught by PhD professors in middle school. And I had high, you know, the highest level, I studied black history in school. And so all of the things that really would make me successful in this world, I learned by the time I was in 12th grade. And that was really my foundation, a way of learning. And so I had to, I had to really, that book taught me to lean on my background, like especially the chapter about Omar, his, his grandfather or great grandfather, I think, yes. uh, um, really sent, sent a message home to me that I have to like look to my culture and my background and make and, and translate that those ideas and thoughts to my students. And it had to come through a lot of patience and a lot of understanding. But reading reading leadership books, but treated gentle, I'll say it was really sort of the foundation for me in establishing the jazz program. So where where was the program as you found it in terms of faculty, in terms of students, in terms of the what they were teaching and how they were teaching it? And then what were your goals in terms of uh, is it fair to say totally reimagining it or taking what it was and kind of extending it? Like, how did you approach it? Well, my number, my number one approach to building a program was when I found a program, it had a good foundation of great players, good players in the program, but not a degree program at all. So the first task is I had a friend named Pat Smith who was retired, who came on to help me uh, start the program. And our first mission was really to get a degree in place because specializations don't really work where you just have classes and people are majors in other programs. And I had a chance to, to go online at that time and look at all of the programs and I looked at how they function. And, and I noticed that most of the really good programs that were vibrant had a community the undergraduate and graduate students, and um, they had, uh, you know, full-time lines. So there was a full-time sax teacher, trumpet teacher, and all this sort of stuff. So I looked at my budget, and I had probably at that time like 10 people that were part-time. And what I decided, I had to make a tough decision and that I really only needed five or six full-time people. So I was able to, you know, reimagine the dollars that we had and um, and give everybody full time positions. And I had a, a boss who empowered me to make that kind of decision. And that's a tough decision to make. But I realized early out that if I had 15, 10, 10 to 15 part time people, I got to do all the recruiting. But if I have five or six full time people, then they have a recruiting obligation. 
And so I made kind of sound things like that, decisions like that early out. And then uh, over time, I, I've um, negotiated and worked towards having, and almost everyone now on faculty are tenured over time. And that was, and that was really like um, seeing that that exists at all the top places. In jazz, we always deal with it in equity because it's looked at something as an extra and something that's outside of the canon and very li little resources are ever committed to it. And that's why it, it, it's not successful. And that's what I looked at. I looked at what are, how are the ways in which uh, theory departments thrive? How does, how does um, um, you know, musicology thrive? It's because it has full-time people. Because you can imagine if you had a musicology department and everybody was part time, you know, it'd be hard to maintain your credit uh, accreditation because the research wouldn't be there. And um, but because because you have full time people, they have an obligation to do the research in order to get tenure and to go through the process. So I really like actually learn the process of how the university works. And it, and it was a, a lot of lot of question asking questions of people, and I and I think that's the number one thing is that I'm curious, and I all I I learned a lot from my colleagues over time. I ask a lot of questions. Well, that fits in nicely with our series because it's called Jazz for Curious Listeners. So I think <laughs> curiosity is important. Two questions now. One is um, in terms of the actual music that the students were playing and sure. that whole kind of thing. Like, where did you find it? Where did you want to take it uh, in terms of, you know, what the, what they had to study with the private teachers, what, what the ensembles would play, where the focus was. Uh, and yeah. then B also, you know, how did this um, impinge on your career as a world-class uh, uh, musician who was used to you know doing all these things i mean you were you know on so many records and so many festivals and all over the place so those are my two next questions well the, the number one thing was when i when i took over the program in the program we had already begun we had a director before me uh the alto saxophonist andrew spate was running the program and he left to go to san francisco and then i became the director but they were already playing Ellington and Basie and really good, you know, sort of music that I that I grew up in on, um, and so that there was a foundation for that. But we didn't have a lot of music in the library, so I the first thing is I had to I had to build a library with those things like Basie, Ellington, Jimmy Lunsford, um, you know, uh, Fletcher Henderson charts. Uh, you know, all of those like sort of swings, you know, I thought like if you're going to have a big band, the foundation has to be swing. And a lot of a lot of um, jazz programs, it's not. Now that's kind of changing. People are now playing Ellington in almost every university now. And things like Thad Jones, big band charts, we had some of those things in there. But I, I really wanted it to be a foundation. But I also grew up in bebop culture in Detroit. You know, most of the people I studied with were students of Barry Harris at some point, my mentors. And so I wanted that, that sort of Detroit foundation of learning bebop and learning that way was a part of it. And really like basing the emphasis on blues, knowing the, knowing the culture and history of jazz was important because I found as I traveled, uh, even before I became director of the program, that not a lot of people knew a lot about jazz. They knew like maybe from 1960 to 68. And that was what they thought about jazz history. So a lot of, and so I had to do a lot of reading because I had a lot of holes in my understanding of jazz. And, but, and also, so, you know, I had a really good faculty, a guy named Diego Rivera, who still teaches with me, plays tenor sax, very smart young guy who would make really good suggestions in the beginning. And my, my concept of leadership is that it doesn't have to be my idea. It just has to be a good idea. And so I took a lot of ideas from the faculty over time. ATM Charles became a faculty member, Michael Bees, Randy Gillespie is a drummer. 
Uh, we had Reggie Thomas there for a time, and uh, Randy Napoleon is our guitar teacher, and Xavier Davis is now the piano teacher. Mm. And so I learned I learned a lot from the faculty as they came in and take suggestions, and people would say, "Well, we should have the students study this or learn that." And um, so over time, it but all of these ideas were really based on jazz culture and how we all learned. And we were, we were able to get sometimes get away from the book because some of the books that were written are not in jazz language, the way, the way that we actually really learn and interpret. So we, cre we were able to create um, a system of learning really based on the three T's as we call it. The, the number one thing, the number three things that we teach in a row, three things are technique, tunes, and transcription. And so that's kind of foundation, you know, where most of us are, we all grew up in Western, the Western world where we all studied classical music is usually like the foundation for playing the instrument, you know, almost everybody studied classically. And so a lot of us, we are using a lot of the A2 books. And for my day students, we do a lot of Bach cello suites. And that, and that language is very similar to jazz. You know, Charlie Parker was influenced by a lot of the things and closures and things that, that Bach had. And so, so a lot of studying that and learning that lends itself to playing, you know, bebop language. And then making sure that your students have a strong sense of the history of your instrument. So like if you play bass, you know, you're gonna study uh, Steve Brown, Bill Hinton, uh, you're going to transcribe Ron Carter, Dave Holland. You're going to check out. Uh, you're going to check out uh, Ray Brown. You know you're going to study, and you're going to learn the whole history of it, all the way to Christian McBride to Esperanza Spalding, and it keeps expanding. But we always go back to early jazz, and our, our students know historically about early jazz. They learned the tunes. And they go, but they learn how to play and transcribe all those great players from Sidney Bechet to uh, Louis Armstrong, you know, to to Will, Willie the Lion Smith. So we learn that, and we all come to present day. And so we study the hundred plus years of history of jazz, and we don't segregate any of it. We talk about fusion. We play fusion too, because I think like one of the things that happens in jazz education is that we become either or. We really get into this whole thing of either censoring how jazz history has evolved, or, because you know, I was talking to someone, they went to a program and they say they study from early jazz uh, to 1960. But there's another, you know, 60 years of history that, that happened. You know, so whether, whether I agree with it or disagree with it, this is what happened. This is what happened. I have to like be honest. And, and, and also I realize, I realize as an educator, and I'll answer the second part of the question, as an educator, it's not really my role to tell the student what to do with what I teach them. They get to become whatever they want to become. It's my role to say, here's the music, here's the information, here's the culture. And if they become a pop star and they're happy, then I'm happy. If they want to become Benny Carter, certainly I'd be happy. If they want to play jazz and swing, I'm happy. But I don't get to tell them what. I have students that are hip hop producers. But one of my students did a hip hop track and the, uh, and the background was bird with strings. So I'm happy. <laughs> and the second part of that question, the challenge that you have is because a lot of us have such little respect for education and don't, because we have been excluded from it. Um, and when I first came off the road, because I had to really take a period of coming off the road to really develop the program in Michigan, at Michigan State. Uh, a lot of people thought I'd lost my mind and didn't understand why I did it and questioned a lot of, a lot of that. And um, 
and I lost a lot of work a lot of gigs and uh, so now you know I'm back to doing a lot more touring and playing but it took it was um, you're talking I left the Jazz and Lincoln Center Orchestra in 2003 to do this and it really took me till about 2010 to really start being able to travel and play again and I really started touring and traveling through doing workshops being guest artists at universities and high schools. And then from there, I started making a lot of my own recordings. I had a group with Carl Allen that we had on Mac Avenue. And that was really how I began to tour a lot of more. And so now I have a pretty good balance uh, where I tour and play and teach. And, um, but it, it's been a challenge. But now the interesting thing is everyone I know is trying to get a teaching job. Could you talk about some of the uh, your ensembles? I mean, I know that your students not only you know have traveled uh, internationally, but you were telling me when we were talking a while ago about uh, tremendous programs that you do within your own state, more locally. Oh, yeah. Where you take the students well, through, through these towns and stuff like that, and I that's one thing I really applaud about your program is that it's both uh, international, national, and really kind of local too. Well, one one of the things I was moved by this um, article I read years ago, uh, Phil Woods. And I learned, I learned a lot from reading articles and especially from the cats, people like Phil Woods. Phil Woods said, uh, and I got to record with him a few times in different sessions and things over the years. And, um, and I read this article and he said, if he had a jazz program, he would put the students on the bus and go from town to town to town to town. You know, and a lot of that is not necessarily practical, but how do you how do you how do you achieve that? So I started looking at programs to see who tour, and really sort of like the best programs like University Next North Texas University of Miami, at the time Ron Carter was at Northern Illinois when I was looking at that. They did a touring component every year, and all of them would bring in guest artists, and uh, so I started thinking about that. And we had an opportunity. We our local credit union. Uh, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union sponsored Branford Marcellus to come in um, that spring. And this was really about eight years ago. And we played this concert and a lot of the officials from the credit union were there. And I said, man, it would be amazing if we could do this all the time, apply for a grant. And uh, with the, the help of our development department, a lady named Rebecca Syrian, we applied for the grant and got a million dollar endowment. And the pro, yeah, and the, the proceeds from the endowment, as we wrote up, allowed us to tour across the state. And initially we were talking two or three times a year, but it expanded to four because there was so much need across the state of people wanting the guest artists to come in. But the nice thing about the grant is that it allows uh, each community we go into to charge tickets with the national guest artists, and then they keep the proceeds for their band program. And so it's become a su very successful program. And it's good for us because we get, as a faculty, we get artists to come in that shape our perspective. So it serves to educate, to keep us informed and educated on new techniques or new ways of looking at music and just a different perspective. But it also brings new people to our students. And a lot of our students, before they move to New York, they are, almost every student's goal is to move to New York that comes out of the program, um, that they've already met jazz musicians. So it's networking possibilities uh, and it connects them to the tradition of jazz. So there's that mentorship that happens when they meet these musicians. And, uh, but it also gives our community fresh, vibrant voices and faces. And uh, so we've had everybody. We've had Melissa Aldana. We've had, uh, um, you know, um, who am I thinking? Uh, um, um, Tanya Darby. We've had, uh, we've had uh, Steve, Steve Wilson, uh, Steve Davis. 
I mean, everybody, you know, all the, you know, people on the scene, on the scene to come spend a week with us. And it's really transformative. It changes our lives in a positive way. But we also hear from the guest artists that come into our program changes their life. And, and it gives some people are like, I have hope in jazz education from spending time in, in East Lansing. And the community is really supportive. Like the artists are blown away that we do this thing at the credit union on Monday night at the start of the residency. And I'll tell you about the residency. It starts on Monday night. They actually it starts Monday morning, 7 a.m. They get up, they drive to Detroit, they do a pre press thing with the, on TV and Detroit. They come back later that afternoon, we play at the credit union and 450 people show up to greet the artists and hear them play. And they play with the faculty. Tuesday, they teach at the school. Wednesday, we start touring. And we go across the state and it's life changing. And it's a beautiful, we do this four times, four to, four to six times a year, we bring in artists. And it's changed our curriculum, it's changed the ability uh, of our players because it's, it's a real, it makes it as real as it can be because really about every four, four weeks, you gotta learn new music. So the kids become very proficient sight readers and they can interpret music on a higher level because, and Charles Mingus said that jazz is the art of the moment. And the, the challenge with college is, you know, in education is that, you know, you have this one concert at the end of the semester and you worked on this music for, you know, eight to three months, eight weeks to, you know, 12 weeks. And then you play this one little concert and that's it. But we play the same. We play the same music six times, five to six times on a tour, right? Every night we have to do a different combined piece with the high school. And a lot of times I don't give them the music ahead of time because I want them to come in and sight read the music because that's what it's going to be. And because we have various different artists, we're playing every style of jazz. You know, so we're playing, some people will pick swing charts, some people will pick bassy, some people will pick uh, original stuff, some people will pick really modern charts. And so in order for you to play in our group, you got to be open musically. And I always say to students that, and I actually learned this from you when we used to do the dance set. You know, and you, I don't know if you remember this, but you said, you know, and I remember somebody saying something about the music being corny. And you said something like, well, it can be corny, but if you don't sound good playing it, you know, you got to put your, you got whatever the music is, is the music. And that's what I tell my students. You have to give everything 100%. Whether you, whether you like the style or don't like the style, you're a professional. You're being paid most of the time. Nobody wants your opinion. They want you to play the chart. If you can't, if you have your opinion and you don't know how to play the chart or interpret the chart, then your opinion doesn't mean anything. You were you talking about play. you were talking about back in the early days of the JALC where they would bring yeah. me in to conduct uh, at, at the uh, uh, at the fundraisers, at the, and we would do gala. a set of dance music at the gala. Right, 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 right. 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 I, you know, one aspect of the things that you're talking about um, that I, gosh. We didn't have when I went to music school way back when, but and most don't. I would assume is the bonding that goes on of the students just by the vent, just by oh, traveling, yeah. and just by hanging and spending that amount of time. It's not just going to room three sixty five uh, four days a week. You know, you are kind of living yeah. together, and that's kind of I would assume that's kind of like uh, irreplaceable. There's nothing that substitutes for that. Well, we, we had a tour, we, we uh, affectionately dubbed the NyQuil tour because uh, it, was, it was one, um, it was a cold fall in October, some years ago, maybe about four years ago. And uh, we had a great guest artist. We had none other than the great Christian McBride. And, uh, but everybody in the band was sick. Everybody had a cold. And, you know, you're on a bus in close quarters, you're going to get sick. Every, I got sick, everybody, by the end of the tour, the only person that didn't get sick was Christian McBride. I don't know how. 
he didn't get sick, but he did. He's got the the magical personality, but he didn't get sick. But uh, and at one point, one of the trumpet players got on the bus with some Nyquil and was passing out Nyquil, Dayquil, I think, because everyone was sick. Everybody had a cold. But we played the best we ever played because you have to play. And I had to give the you know General MacArthur speech every night. You know, I know you all are tired. You know, we haven't had a hot meal, and we but we got a forger. You know, we got to and we have to be in Palermo uh, by tomorrow morning. And so, so we we uh, but sometimes you know we sometimes I remember doing a we were on stage rehearsing with a guest artist, and I got the word that Roy Hargrove passed, and I was very close with Roy, and um, and I'm conducting the band. I got a text from someone. And uh, while I'm conducting the band, and I start crying, and uh, the band wanted to know why I was crying, what I was uh, upset, and I explained that to them. But then they wanted to play good for me because they knew how much. And we ended up playing one of Roy's big band charts on that tour. And every night, you know, I would cry. But they were, they were, that, and it makes it real. That's how it is being on the road. And we would, you know, being there on the bus with the guest artists to ask questions, you know, about their experiences and and their experiences with uh, a lot of their mentors, you know, um, having great artists like Jimmy Heath, who uh, he didn't do a tour, he did a residency with us. But just being able to ask questions about what was it like to meet Bird, or we had, we toured with Jimmy Cobb, and everyone's asking him about Miles and Paul Chambers and, and his perspective really sort of uh, changed the way our students see the world and see history. Could you talk about that for a moment? Because, you know, with, with Jimmy Cobb in particular, and this happens sometimes, you know, someone's on a famous record and, yeah. and in their whole life, it was like one year of a 60 year right. career or the trio with Winton Kelly and Paul Chambers. And like, that's one decade, but you know, he had played with Dinah Washington long before that. And he did all these things afterwards. And I'm, I'm wondering what was it about that experience with Jimmy Cobb that was so, so important? Well, I think, I think he had a Jimmy Cobb, the experience with Jimmy Cobb was so important because he had an honesty about the perspective. Cause he would be like, we weren't thinking that kind of blue was going to become this thing. It was just another Miles Davis record deal. Or him saying to us, one of the bass players said, you know, what was it like playing with Paul Chambers? And he would say, I don't know how this guy was so good so young. And you just don't think about it. I mean, that, sh that reshaped my whole way of seeing Paul Chambers because he was 30 some years old when he died and played on 300 some records by then. Uh, but he was a kid. And Jimmy Cobb was older than he was and saw him as a kid. Like he was a talented kid, but that's no different than the way Jimmy Cobb sees Christian McBride or Peter Washington or me or any up and coming young kid that can play. Um, and then sometimes like you'd ask him about Dizzy or Dinah Washington and Dinah Washington, he would just go, and that said everything. There was nothing else that needed to be said. <laughs> Plus, I imagine also just seeing how these, uh, these, these folks, and you too, I mean, to ha having been on the road so much, how you deal with the challenges that come from the amp isn't right, or the drums are in the funny place, or the microphones, you know, with just all those day-to-day -day yeah. challenges and seeing how real professionals deal with that stuff, as opposed to being an entitled college student or something like that. I mean, that, that's real. You know, the, the thing that struck me the most was that really sort of, because he was, Jimmy wasn't that well. He had, had recently had some kind of medical procedure. And this was maybe about three or four years ago. And he wasn't very well. Um, and really, he would get on the bus the first couple of days and go to sleep. So I bought him like a, one of those pillow things. So he can be, I stopped the bus and we stopped at a department, a little store. And I bought him a pillow thing and made sure he was comfortable. 
And um, and so he would get on the bus the first couple of days and go to sleep. And um, but every time we would play, he would be swinging so hard. The students would be like, how, how is he doing this? Where's this energy? So it's like, you know, when it was time for the gig, he would bring it. And all of the high schools we played at, it was interesting. They were they were so impressed that we had Jimmy Cobb. I think people were the most impressed by Jimmy Cobb than any guest artist we had, that they treated him like a king. So every place, people would bring their sofa recliner. Because we, we spent all day at the high school. So we'd get there 10, 11 in the afternoon, and we'd do workshops and sectionals, and then have dinner with the high school kids. And then, because it's part of the whole cultural experience for our students and for their students. And the guest artist is there. And every place we went, people would bring their reclining chairs from home and set him up a nice place with music and have good food for him and have teas and coffees. And they treated him like a king. So it was really beautiful to see that. And uh, he was really moved by that. Because I think, I think also, too, like uh, playing jazz in America, you never really received that kind of respect. Like if, if he was in Europe or in Japan, you know, people idolize him, but a lot of people don't really, we live in a nation where people don't know, but we kind of, we've kind of, um, we have a community in our state where people really love jazz. And they were really there before we started doing this, but this has helped build their programs. I don't know if it's fair to ask. It's almost asking like a, a parent about their, their favorite children, but would you want to talk about uh, some of the students that you've had who uh, sure. who've meant a lot to you and the program? Well, you know, it's hard to do this sometimes talking about the program because there's so many really good players and you forget to mention people, but you know, some standards, we had a bass player who's pretty good named Ben Williams, who went to, who went on from us to go to Juilliard and uh, won the Thelonious Monk competition and and went on to be Pat Metheny's bass player for a while and was out doing his own thing. A, te a Barry Sax player named Tony Lustick, who's a quite extraordinary guy who uh, who's now playing with uh, playing with uh, everybody in New York. Went to Juilliard as well. Tenor player named Chris Bullock that plays with Snarky Puppy, you know, doing pretty well. A producer named Thaddeus Dixon who lives in Los Angeles now, who produces hip hop and uh, is doing pretty well. We got, we had a drummer named Lawrence Leathers, you know, who went to Juilliard for a while. Still a player who we lost recently. Um, a lot of the up and coming guys named Luther Allison, who's in New York playing now. And, and um, there's so many, George Delancey, who's on the scene in New York, came through our program. Um, this, then we got a guy, Pierre Charles, that's out doing film scoring. Um, I mean, there's there's so many players, you know, that really committed themselves to playing the music. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to give you a ray. We have a trumpet player who's a professor named Chris Johnson, who also played in the Count Basie Orchestra. Uh, Anthony Stanko is a now great trumpet player who plays in, uh, who's a professor down at Miami Dade Community College. Uh, so we got a lot of people who are either educators or great players. And some people are combining careers as players and arrangers um, and, and uh, performers and educators. Uh, and we try to teach them where they get, they got to be all of that now. That's the 21st century musician. But there's, I'm, I'm leaving out so many people but there's so many incredible players. Yeah, we have we have another really incredible bass player that came through the program named India Owens, and uh, we act, we act, India and I actually had the same high school teacher, year, years and years apart, of course. But she went on; she's gone on to be a great player on the the Late Show, I think it is. Um, and uh, she's 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 my one of my base daughters, so I love her dearly. Well, we're really proud of the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. She's coming on in a in a significant role this year in doing some things with us too. Uh, and I remember when she was at Juilliard. I mean, she's well anyway. She's making her own path, and uh, yes. 
We're very, very Truly. proud, proud of that. Uh, let me ask you a question, Rodney. I mean, you know, you're you're looked to and respected as a leader uh, in jazz education. How are you folks dealing at your school with the challenges of 2020? Well, you know, we're, the challenges of 2020 with online teacher and virtual teaching. Initially, we had thought we would meet in person and that, you know, we would be able to do that. And then immediately we shifted gears about a week before school and had to really plan virtual teaching, which is really a challenge. Um, but but we had to we had to we had to uh, really come up to it and investigate technology. And so we're doing a lot of listening classes for big band and still providing uh, our tours for our high schools, but done virtually in workshops, still giving them access because they really need this at this point because they're struggling to keep their band programs together. A lot of the programs only are really doing a marching band in person. And uh, if they have a band, they're only meeting like with half the band a couple times a week and the other half another time a week. So they have a lot of challenges. So we're really trying as hard as possible to be a resource to our community of high schools and middle schools, um, but also providing good instruction, quality online instruction for our students and really thinking outside the box. How do we use technology? Um, how do we keep them playing? How do we encourage them to practice? And with lessons, you know, we, we all just had to, you know, bite the bullet and figure it out. And um, we've been doing a good job, I think. Well, the, the, you know, in the, in the COVID era, the other thing that we have to be mindful of is that there are a lot of issues that the students that are important to the students that we have to sort of keep in focus, even though we're in COVID. You know, like we revamped a lot of our jazz history courses to include more women leaders and composers and arrangers. And that um, I teach a styles and analysis class and I tried to make sure every segment of the course included women leaders and musicians throughout the course. So that, so my concept that I think about is called Mirrors and Windows that was um, uh, created by a great, um, a great, um, sociologist, I think her last name is Stiles. And, um, and in this concept is that you have to have a window to see your own self culturally as a way of developing culturally. But then that window also is a mirror to see into other folks' lives and cultures. And so what I think about now is that I wanna make sure that everyone who comes through the program can see themselves culturally within the world of jazz, but also because they see themselves, they can also see other folks and the value of other culture. And so the two things I'm thinking about is inclusion all the time and how we teach, but also the other thing that I'm thinking about is social justice and how we teach. And that we have to, there's, the, the, the constitution is really mere, merely a, a promise of what we could be. And we have to commit ourselves to working on being a more perfect union. And that, that's, in, that's in the center of jazz. We have shortcomings. We have a, a music that didn't necessarily include, did not include women and was segregated. And we, we have to deal with that first. That's part of our identity. And how do we change the identity of jazz? And through truth, and there's a lot of things that we have to learn about ourselves and see ourselves and really realize that this music and this art form and this nation and our constitution are works in progress. I don't know what to say after that except two words, which is thank you for thank you. this interview, uh, for the first part, for the second part. And uh, thank you, Rodney Whitaker. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. Always a pleasure. Thank you.